Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Please come on in and take your seat, if you would. We're so excited to have you with us this morning, and so thank you for being here. We're grateful that you've made us a part of your Sunday. Hey, if you didn't get one of these bulletins, please make sure that you do. I want to take a moment right now and point out a few specific items that are in your bulletin that relate to some upcoming events, and you don't want to be left behind. You want to make sure you're aware of them as well. So if you didn't get one of our bulletins, just send someone over to one of the doors, and we'd be happy to give those to you. Don't forget, if you would, that there is a connection card at the bottom of these bulletins. Fill that out right now. Later on in the service, we'll pass the offering plates. Put that completed connection card into the offering plate. And then, of course, if you have prayer requests, there's a place for those on the back. Our staff each week prays for those, and so our deacons do as well. So please fill that, fill that out. Is there something in your life or your family's life that you'd like us as a church family to remember? Jot that down. Fill out that connection card right now. Tear it off at the perforation and slip it completed into the offering plate later. So there is a lot going on around this place in any given week. And right now, with the end of the school year coming, the summer beginning, there's much going on. One week from tonight, on May 26th, we're going to be doing our annual movie night. Now, I'm super excited about that for this reason. This kind of is one of those markers, one of those mile markers in the, in the year, right? Because this is sort of what launches you into the summer season. I know not every school will be out next weekend, but ours will be. And I know our kids will be pretty happy about that. Whatever the case, though, this does give you a great way to start off the summer, May 26th, one week from tonight. We're going to be showing the Lego Movie Part 2, so please come out and be a part of that. You can see in your bulletin the rest of the details that we start at 7, but we won't actually officially show the movie until it's dark enough to see it outside. But there will be plenty to do for the kids and for you as a family. It's a great way for us to bring our community together. Of course, this also, though, launches us for the summer schedule into our season of sports camps. Don't forget that both June and July are busy months with sports camps on Wednesdays. So we're going to start with our soccer camps in June and then our basketball camps in July. Here's one reason why you need to know that, so that you can sign up your kids who are 4 to 11 years old. Here's another reason. We're going to need your help. I hope everyone in some way helps us with our sports camps. And you're probably thinking, well, I don't know what I could do. I'm not all that skillful. That's okay. Whether you're praying for us, whether you're donating. In fact, we could always use a bit more or updated equipment for both soccer and basketball. Maybe you'd like to say, hey, I'd like to replace all those worn-out soccer balls, those worn-out basketballs, whatever ones that you need to get rid of, phase them out. I'd like to donate new ones. Come see me, and we'd be happy to work that out. Maybe all you can do at this point is just pray that God uses that in the lives of community people. If you're volunteering in one of those two ways, hey, praise God for that. Maybe you don't want to run around chasing kids all evening. That's okay. Could you help us with registration? Sit at the table, welcome people, smile, and let them know that the joy of Jesus is not just something that we put on. It's, it's a way that we live. So that's all of June and July. If you have not yet in some way prayed through how you could be a part of it in one of the ways that I mentioned or something I didn't think of, if you haven't done that yet and you want to know more, go over to the Info Center. See me, one of the pastors, see Amy, see Isaac. We'd be happy to tell you more about how God is using those summer sports camps. Incidentally, our relationship with the closest school, the elementary school over here in our backyard, Fairview Elementary, that relationship has really built over the last few years, and this is one of the primary ways that we do it. So we've gotten to know a lot of the people who live in the homes that surround this church building through something as simple as providing sports camps and clinics throughout the year to their kids. And so I hope, I hope you'll take advantage of that. Let me also mention, though, that, of course, Summer Fun Day is right smack dab in the middle of all that. That's a full-day event. More about that later. But go on to our website. Stop by the Info Center. We need lots and lots and lots of help, and we hope you're a part of that. Our summer season also, though, is a time for us to begin thinking about camp for our kids. Last year, for the first time in a long time, we officially, as a church, sent our junior campers off to Camp Manitoumi. Boy, do I, I have a lot of respect for what John and Judy Keelan are doing as they lead the camp at Manitoumi and for all the work and effort and time that they put into it, for the way that they pray constantly for God to be at work in the lives of young boys and girls. They sacrifice, they pour themselves into it. In fact, I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to get out of the way and 
allow Pastor John to come and tell us a bit more about Camp Manitoumi, which we're offering this year, both for juniors as well as for junior high. Welcome, John, with me, would you please? Well, greetings from Camp Manitoumi, land of God, the fun place to learn the right way to live. Never heard a discouraging word, and it's 80 degrees all the time. Mm. We wish. Thank you for sending your campers. Uh, camp, that's what it's all about. We can have the greatest facilities, which we do. We can have all the, the zip lines, which we have, and the, bo uh, the, the hamster balls, and you name it, and all that, but it's about kids making a decision for Christ. Uh, camp 62 years old, we're thankful for that. Uh, debt free, that's even a blessing. But it's great to see young people get saved. 14 last year, and numerous other decisions. Do be praying, I understand you come for junior two, that's 20, July 22 through the 27th, and then junior high camp, uh, eight through 13 on July and uh, we would love to see them there. Uh, one thing, please check out our table. Uh, we've got brochures and everything. If you register today, in other words, just pre-register, instead of $40, it's 35 if you're planning on coming. So I would encourage you to do that at the table. This year, one of the things we're doing for every camper is a free t-shirt. In fact, I told Junior High they can have as many free t-shirts as they want, up to one. And they jumped on that. They thought that was great. So do do that. Uh, our theme this year is finding the truth. Um, more and more, the Internet's not the truth. And uh, different things that are out there, the truth is here. And that's what our desire, that's what our goal is, is to do that at camp. So do be praying for us. We do have a website. Check it out. We've got at least four hours of video if you uh, want to see what we're all about, go to manitoumi.com or we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook and Twitter and whatever else is out there. But I uh, do encourage you to do that. Again, thank you for sending them. That's what, to me, is what camp is all about. Thank you, John, so much. So do make sure you stop in and see John at his display and also realize that this summer as we send kids to camp, do be praying for them, for the camp as well as for the kids. John didn't mention this out loud, but I'm going to say it. They are still at this point now short a few staff positions. If you'd like to know more about one of your high schoolers or even you yourself being involved, just stop by and see John. They could use specifically a few workers in the dining hall, a few lifeguards as well. So if you're interested in that, I hope you'll jump on that. So excited that our kids get a chance to do that. They'll love it. I spent so many years at camp, and I watched God work, and uh, certainly that's exactly what happens at Camp Manitoumi. Would you bow your heads with me, and let's pray as we begin our service this morning. God, we love you. Thank you so much for today. Praise you for this ministry that's close by. And God, I praise you for a way to invest in the lives of kids. I thank you for our partnership with Camp Manitoumi. John and what he does there and all the staff, God, so many people invest in the lives of kids for the sake of eternity. So I pray for your blessing on them. God, I pray as well for the McQueries. That's our, our, our missions emphasis this month, God. So I praise you for Bob and Gail. Thank you for their work at Worldview Ministries. I know that Bob's main emphasis as the director of church planting is to try to find national pastors, to identify who they might be, to train them, to support them, to help them as they plant churches, specifically in unreached people group areas. Their main points of focus, God, including church planting, and national training, and Bible translation, is that they, Bible translating is that they reach those unreached people groups. So many languages still don't have a Bible in their own tongue. So I praise you for ministries like Worldview. I pray, God, that as we accompany them through this journey, as they're trying to work in India and Uganda and Nepal and China and Myanmar and all of these areas, God, I pray that you would lift up men, women who love you and who proclaim the name of Jesus. So thank you for allowing us to proclaim the name of Jesus here as even abroad and around the world the same thing is being done. And I pray that the light of the gospel might shine gloriously. So we praise you for the McQueries. Thank you for the Keelans and Camp Manitoumi and for the chance today to worship you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Let's stand together this morning. We're going to start our service by singing together. Let's lift our voices. verses here as we enter into the Lord's Supper. A couple of verses that are, if you've grown up in church, this, these are going to be verses that are very familiar to you. Um, but often, a lot of times, because the things become familiar, we often lose the significance of them. So I want to read these to us as we, as we enter around uh, communion together here. John 3, 16, verse 17 as well says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
So again, just to, to take a moment and, and meditate on that, on, on, on that passage there, those two verses that we read. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his begotten son, so that, so that all who would believe in him would find eternal life, life that, that goes on forever in perfect joy and communion with him. And, and I just love verse 17, that, that God didn't send, send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I think even of Romans 8, 1, for those that are in Christ, there's therefore now no condemnation, right? We don't stand condemned anymore. And it's because of what we're about to remember here as we gather around and as we eat the, eat the bread and we drink the cup, we're remembering exactly this, that God sent his son into the world to save and redeem a people who are lost, who are chasing after darkness that did not want him. But yet God came and said, even though you don't want me, I want you. I'm going to send my son to redeem you and call you back to myself to reconcile us with the Father, life as we were meant to live. And so that now, through faith in him, we have life, eternal life, everlasting. It's an incredible, incredible message, this gospel that we proclaim, that we sing about, and that we rest in, that we preach week in, week out. And, and I love that we as a church gather often. Scripture says to, to, to do this often in remembrance of Jesus because we, we say this every time that we gather on his table. Um, we say we want to gather around here because the moment we take our eyes off of Christ, we're going we're to place him on ourselves. We're going to place him on other things. We're prone to forget. We're prone to wander. So, so we, we take this time to kind of recalibrate. Say, okay, it's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's him. It's not me. All right, it's not I, it's Christ who works through me. And so as we eat this bread, we want to remember the broken body of Jesus on the cross for the sins of humanity, for your sins. As we drink the cup, we want to remember the spilled blood of Jesus Christ, the death of Christ for the remission of sin. All right, scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so this is a time where we, we remember this. And so this is a time for Christians. And so if you are a believer, meaning you are a follower of Christ, and in fact, to, to, there's part of me that wishes we were doing this after the sermon today because we're going to talk about what, what a true follower of Christ is and what Jesus calls us to. But if you are a follower of Jesus in, in that you are dying to self and you are identifying with Christ, as you, that you are taking up your cross daily and following after him, right? that you're pleading the blood of Christ, not your good works, we invite you to take part in this with us this morning, to remember <clears throat> the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. If you're an unbeliever here, if you're not a Christian here this morning, we're glad you're here, and we want this time to be a testimony to you to, to repent of sin, to turn from, from, from your religious actions. Maybe you think by sitting here, this is earning favor with, with God. Um, we are going to lovingly proclaim and, and tell you it is not. All right? You, you sitting here today, though we love that you're here, this is not earning favor with your God. This is not earning salvation with God. You can't earn it. We, we turn to Christ, and that's what the church is doing here. And so our, our plea to you this morning would be to confess your sins, to repent of sins, and turn to Christ alone for the salvation of your souls. And so believe in him. And then for the church as, well, as, we, <clears throat> as we take this time here together, let's take time to confess. Let's take time to repent. The the, the worship team's going to sing this song, Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me. They're going to sing this over us as we, as we, as we hold on to this bread, as we, as we hold on to this cup. And so take the time to, to even think about the words. Take, take time to, to meditate upon John 3, 16 and 17, to confess sin, to repent of sin, and to just rest solely and fully in the cross of Jesus. That's what this time is all about. So I want to invite our deacons to come up, and we're going to serve the church here this morning.
when he had given thanks he broke it and said that this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me scripture goes on says in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to take an offering here. It's our benevolence offering. And so every dollar you give in this offering here goes to helping those inside and outside of our church, those that were just struggling financially. And so this is just a response of, or just a gospel work in our lives. And so we, each month when we take this offering, we just encourage our church, as we always do with any time that we're called to give, is to give generously, not out of obligation, um, but out of delight because of the work that Christ has done in us. And so this is a way in which we can um, serve those inside and outside of our church um, and, and just reveal to them that it's, it's, it's um, the worldly treasures of this world are not what we're after, but we're after Christ. And so we live freely and open-handedly with all that we own. And so with that, we're going to sing the song, His Mercy is More, as we continue just to reflect on what we've just been celebrating here, what we've been gathered around here, thinking on just the mercy of Christ. His mercy is more. Though our sins there are many, His mercy is more. So let's stand and let's sing this. As we, as we sing this song, you go ahead and stand. Kids, fifth grade and down, can head out during, these, during the song to the right here and uh, go to their, their program today. But let's sing this song here together.
be seated. Well, before we dig into uh, the, the preaching and teaching this morning, we're thankful to have, uh, over the last couple of weeks, Jack and Lindsay Campbell here with us. Now, Jack is um, a, a former resident of Normal, Illinois. I think we know him for, at least know the family for the most part really well. But Jack and Lindsay, their family, are going on to the mission field. And so we want to give him, this is their final week with us, we want to just give him a few minutes just to share with us, with the church, where they're going and what they're doing, just how we can partner with them and pray for them. Thanks. Jack? Thanks, Matt. Uh, yes, my name is Jack Campbell. For those that don't know me, um, I've been my family and been a part of this church since well before I was born. And um, it is, I me tell you, a lot has changed since I've been gone and um, definitely a lot of new things happening here. But it is exciting to see the faithfulness to God's word and the faithfulness to his church that still exists at this church. And it has been a blessing to be back worshiping with you. Uh, this is my family now on the screen. Uh, my wife, Lindsay. And our kids from left to right is Elias, my youngest, and spitting image of me, poor child. And uh, Lucy, my oldest there, and Titus on the far right, my middle child. And uh, yes, God has called us to be missionaries with Wycliffe Bible Translators in an area of the world known as Francophone Africa. And all that means is the part of Africa that their primary language is French. So that mostly uh, is geographically speaking, that's mostly Central and Western Africa with the exception of Nigeria, which speaks English. Um, but that is the primary language. Now, there are lots of languages in the country, and God is, you see, God has led us through a, a variety of events and um, ways that he's shown us what he wants for us. See, since, even since college, my wife and I have been talking about missions and um, knew that that would be potentially part of our future, not sure what that would look like. And God made it abundantly clear that this was the time for us to go. Uh, and not only did he... Uh, foster desire in our lives for the people that didn't have scripture in their own language, but he also um, just made it clear that this was the time. And we found ourselves in a place where I was looking for a job and um, we were homeschooling the kids and we felt like I had just finished my Master of Divinity and we knew this was the time we were the most mobile in our lives and the time where um, we had the biggest desire to make a change in what was going on around the world. And so um, he opened our eyes to the need around the world. I want to share with you a little bit about that. Uh, our, the thing is, language is one of the, can be one of the biggest barriers in the world. You can walk into the room and meet somebody new, and they can, they can be a different uh, ethnicity. They can be a different skin color. They can be a different height. They can be a different age, anything. And generally, you feel like you can get over that barrier. Um, but there is something different when they don't speak your language. And we, we automatically assume a difference when they don't speak our language. And the flip side of that is if you've ever walked into a room where no one speaks your language, I don't know how many of you have had that experience, but one person opens their mouth and speaks English, there is an instant connection with that person. You know, this person is like me. I can, I can be friends with this person. See, the thing is, all over the world, there are people that see God in that way, where they have that barrier, where they assume God speaks a different language than them. I've heard of people that um, ask the person in the room that speaks English to pray because God speaks English. Well, you need to speak, you, you need to pray because you speak the same language God does. And that breaks my heart because there are people in the world that, that don't believe they speak the same language as their God. And we want to help change that. And so I'll put a map on the, on the um, screen there. This is a map of where Wycliffe Bible Translators has identified the need still existing um, of potential translation projects that are yet to be started. There are 2,100 languages in the world that they believe still need the gospel, uh, the Bible in their own language. And I'll, I'll share with you some more stats in a second that'll show there's actually more languages in the world that don't have the, ling don't have the Bible, but this is just showing the ones that um, there are people that don't even speak a language that uh, has the Bible. In Africa alone, you'll see there, there's 706 languages that they're, they're looking to start a project in. In Africa alone, just the continent of Africa, there are to a total of 2,100 languages in, on the continent. And if you switch to the next graphic there, there you can kind of see the charts here. There's 2,193 languages in the continent of Africa. Um, 258 already have the full Bible in their language. The New Testament exists in 417 of those. Um, there are some parts done already in almost 400 of those. And there are still 1,100 languages that have no scripture. Now, like, like you saw on the map before, 700 of those, they have seen as strategic languages that would help us. But there are people, that means there are 700 people, maybe up to 1,100 people, 
that when they read the Bible, it's not in the same language that they think in, the language they dream in, and they see God as other. And so we want to be a part of changing that. So what that means for my family is uh, we have a lot of training ahead of us, um, not only some, some short trainings here in the next couple of months, but then also I need to get some training in applied linguistics. And then in order to, to be in a Francophone country, we need to learn French. So um, our first assignment is to be in uh, France for a year doing language school. And so we are excited for all the things that are coming up. And what we're looking for, what we're looking for is individuals and families that are willing to partner with us in this project. We find as the most effective way to do ministry is if we can have people that are not, not just people that write a check and send it off and, okay, yeah, you do what you want over there, but people that are invested in what we're doing, not only, not only as a financial help, but also as um, we see this as the most beneficial way for us so that we have people that are connected, that are praying for us, that are, um, they, that are part of our team as we go overseas, and people that we can share with what's going on as we do our ministry in Africa. So we are asking for individuals and, and families that are willing to partner with us in that way. And of course, we would love everybody to pray with us as we do this. We cannot do this without God's help, and that has been made abundantly clear to us. And so if you'd like more information, there's a couple ways you can get that. Uh, you can go to our website there, campbellsonmission.com. On there, you'll find a way to join us. Um, if you'd like to partner with us, there's also a lot of frequently asked questions. I don't have enough time up here to explain every detail of what we're doing, but uh, that will help you a lot in understanding what we're doing. We also have a prayer card that will be available back in the info table at the end of the service. If you'd like to take one of those just to remind yourself to pray for us. And if you are in, interested in partnering with us, um, there's a little brochure that explains everything about that and how you could be um, partners with us in, the, in our ministry. So uh, you can see me or Lindsay will be in the back at the info table at the end of the service. Matt? I want to invite Lindsay to come up on stage. We want to pray for them here, church. Let's pray for him. So, Father, we, um, we know the need is great. Um, as we've spent the last several even years here talking about the need for the gospel to go to the nations and the, the billions of people that are still on this earth right now that have never, never even heard the name of Jesus. And so, God, we, we thank, we're thankful for uh, men and women like this that are standing on stage here. They're saying, we're going to go. Um, that they're giving up the comforts and the security and the trivial things of this world to say that ah, Jesus is better and to love a people that they've never even met. And so, God, that's evidence of the gospel at work in their lives. And so, God, um, would you continue to just fan that flame and grow that desire and that love? God, they, we, we know that there's going to be difficult days ahead. Um, there's going to be obstacles and hardships. There's going to be suffering. And so, God, would you, would you um, sustain them through the, through the power and work of your Holy Spirit alive in them? Pray for Jack and for Lindsay as they, they lead their kids um, to a different area of the world. Um, God, I pray for, for their young children. God, that they would continue to grow in this just love and excitement for, for Jesus being made known for his word be written into languages that people can, can read and understand for the first time how thrilling that is, how exciting that is, to be on the front line of, of that type of ministry, of pushing literally back against that which is dark in the world with the light of the gospel. And so we pray for them. Would you, would you help to raise their support? I pray you would surround them with men and women, with churches that would say, yes, we're in, and um, to, to take them on, to support them and send them and so Romans 10 even says, um, how, how, are, how are preachers to go? How are people to hear if they're not sent? And so um, we as a church even have the responsibility here to, to pray for them, to care for them, and, and to send. And so God, would you, would you help us all be partners together for the glory and renown of Christ in his name and name alone? So God, we love you and pray for um, many fruitful years of ministry in their lives that many souls will come to see and savor and uh, believe in Jesus as Lord over all um, through their faithfulness and their willingness to follow you. Praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Good morning. Grab your Bibles. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, if you would, please. Luke, chapter 9. Page 718. 
If you need to use one of the Bibles in the pew rack around you, Luke chapter 9. When I was about 9 or 10 years old, I remember sitting on the front porch of our house. It was during the summer, and I was having a, a, a very impassioned um, conversation with, with just neighborhood friends of mine that we would just play around with during the summer. And I don't really know how the conversation ended up the way it did, but I do remember having, like I said, just a very passionate um, and motivational talk with my friends on how they needed to become Christians, right? So I was like this little evangelist on our front porch kind of saying, you got to be Christians, you need to become Christians, right? And so, in fact, so in, in, impassioned was I that I, I remember actually just sitting down with them and just pleading with them. I like, just say this prayer, like just say this prayer, even if you don't mean it, right? Like even if you don't mean it, just say this prayer. What's it going to hurt, right? Like what's going to hurt to say it? Now, my mind, in my mind as a 9 or 10-year-old, like, I, I just kind of thought all they needed to do was just say these simple words, right? Jesus, come into my heart, or whatever it may be, right? Like, just say these, these words, even if they didn't really believe them. And somehow, in my, my young mind, I thought that would kind of conjure up, I don't know, the Holy Spirit to just save them. I, you know, the words are being said. We have to say them, even if we don't mean them. Or if, here's just a kind of an insurance policy. I think that was more what I was thinking. It's like, well, like, I mean, what's it going to hurt? Like, let's say... Christianity is true. At least, at least you would have said this prayer, right? Like, and then you're good in the end. It's kind of this insurance policy. They pull off the shelf when they needed it. Now, I, I do believe like my heart was in the right place. Um, I, I, really, I wanted them to be Christians, but I, I was woefully misunderstood, and, and, and I had no clear understanding of what a Christian is, let alone what takes place and happens um, in the moment and in the heart of a person at, the, at that moment of conversion. Like I had no understanding in that moment of, okay, here's what Jesus calls us to. Right? If we're going to follow him, here's what he calls us to. He calls us to follow him. So much of westernized Christianity is centered around comfort, security, prosperity, and yet the central figure of our faith is a Savior who gave up everything, like even his own life to seek and save the lost. And yet somehow along the way, Christianity has just been reduced to a, a simple prayer that we pray, and then maybe here's a few guidelines to follow, and just life goes on as usual. That is not Christianity. That is not what Christ has called us to. David Platt says this, he says, we are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. So, see, no wonder there, there's such a serious deficiency of earnestness in our faith within the, the American church. We, 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 to some degree, don't understand what Christianity is. Or maybe we've somehow rewritten what Christianity is or what it means to be a Christ follower to, to kind of having one foot in with Jesus. Like, yeah, Jesus is my guy, but I've got kind of one foot still resting in the world because I don't want to give up what I'm comfortable with. See, when there's no radical abandonment or denial of self into the things of this world, like we don't or won't cling to Christ as we ought to because we've rationalized in, in our minds and within our minds that we don't need him. We don't need him every hour. We don't need him every minute. We don't need him every second of the day. We just need him maybe when things are difficult. All right, I got my one foot in with Jesus. I need you now, but things are good. Okay, I'm back to living life how I want to live. We center our faith so often, like Platt says, around ourselves when the central message of Christianity is an abandonment of ourselves. When that happens, we don't see his word, as the book of Deuteronomy says, as our very life. I mean, do we do see the word of God. We talked about this last week from Psalm 119, right? That, that, that we find joy and just meditate and think upon the word of God all the day, right? Like when, when we don't see Christianity, what Christ has called us to in that right perspective, we don't see the word of God as our very life. There's then no de desperation or there's no earnestness in our prayers if we pray at all. Our spiritual walk feels dried up, forced, mechanical. This all takes place when we don't fully grasp and understand what Jesus has called us to. And, or maybe a better way to even say it is we often don't fully grasp how Christ has called us to follow him. Or maybe I can even take it one step further. Maybe we don't, we, we don't understand or maybe we do understand um, how Christ has called us to follow him, but we're fearful to walk down that path because of what it requires of us. 
Let me quote David Platt again. He says, radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort, it's not health, it's not wealth, and not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all these things, but in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ, and he is more than enough for us. So we're going to look today in Luke 9 at, at tough words spoken by Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat anything. Like, if there's anyone in here this morning that thinks Jesus was just a good moral teacher and, 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 and just kind of taught us, here's some good principles to live by, listen, I'm going to make an argument that you have not actually read anything that Jesus ever said. In fact, C.S. Lewis would say that anyone who thinks of Jesus as just a good moral teacher is a fool. All right, he goes on to say that the things that Jesus said either would make him a liar or a lunatic or a lord. Those were the only three options. There are no other options. There, Jesus was not just a good moral teacher. In fact, Jesus himself didn't intend to be taken as only a good moral teacher. He didn't leave that option open to us, Lewis would say. No, Jesus intends, as you read through the words spoken by Jesus, he intends for us as followers of him to bow down to him as Lord and to submit everything to him in order to gain that which is better. We are disciples of Jesus Christ and through our text today we're going to see from Jesus' own words that following him really has three things. A requirement, motivation, has a future glory. So let's, let's see that in our text this morning. Luke chapter 9, I want to start in verse 23. Now this is Jesus speaking here, all right, so red letters, why it's in red letters in your Bible. So look at verse 23, Jesus says, and and he said to all, if anyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So point one here this morning, this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning, point one and points two and three will go quicker through. Point one here, following Jesus requires we carry a cross, okay? There's a requirement. Following Jesus requires we carry a cross, So following Jesus is not just about changing your religious status on Facebook or Twitter, all right? It's not about making sure that you've got the Jesus fish, right, sticker on the back of your car or the church that you go to is prominently displayed. Now, if you do, that's okay, right? So don't like slip out of here really quick before Matt sees I have a Jesus fish on my bumper. Like that, that's great, awesome. Love that you do it, that's great. You don't need to run into parking lot afterwards and take it off. That's not what I'm getting after, I'm just saying That's not what defines you as being a follower of Christ. What Jesus is saying is that that being a disciple of Christ is more than just what you say. It's also how you live in complete dependence on him and total abandonment of self. I mean, how many people do we know who say they are Christians, but there is nothing in their life which reveals this to be true? And please don't misunderstand me here either when I say that. I'm not saying that Christianity is just about making sure you always just do the right things and not the wrong things. No, it's not about checking a box or doing the right things against the wrong things. I mean, yes, but again, that's not what makes you a Christian. It's a resting fully and completely in the sufficiency of Christ and Christ alone, which then translates and transforms our lives to live and do that which is right and pleasing in His sight. But what is Jesus actually saying here? Because that's what I'm going to get to, just the meat of what is Jesus getting at. He's saying, if you are going going to follow me, if you are going to be a Christian, if you're saying, yeah, I will follow you, you're my guy, then Jesus is saying, then you've got to die to yourself. There are no other options, right? You've got to abandon yourself. Following Jesus requires we carry a cross, Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this, that when Christ bids a man to come and follow him, he bids that man to come and die. So then, that that begs the question, what is the necessity of carrying this cross ourselves? What's the necessity? Why? Why why must we? Why does Jesus require that we carry the cross? Well, I want to talk first about what this is not saying. Okay, so I want to make sure we understand what Jesus is saying correctly. So here's what it is not, or here's what he's not saying. He's not saying that this is you dying for your own sins. Okay, so again, Christ's finished work on the cross. We've celebrated this morning at communion. Christ's finished work on the cross himself paid that penalty for us. So the debt has been paid in full. It is finished. We owe nothing. All right, so as a Christ fault, you owe nothing. The debt has been paid in full. So carrying your cross does not mean I'm somehow dying for my own sins. This is not a way in which we earn or curry favor with God. This is also what it is not. 
The Roman Catholic Church teaches that in order to gain God's grace or salvation, you need to work for it. In fact, I, I found this just the other day. A Catholic priest was recently quoted as saying this. He says, to share in the graces Christ merited for us or to win for others a share in them, we must use the means of grace that he has established. The sacraments, prayer, keeping the commandments, bearing the crosses of life, voluntary penance, etc. I mean, you hear what he's saying. He's saying, okay, here's God's grace, right? So Jesus died on the cross, so, so there is salvation. It's out there, but the, you've got to work to get it, all right? So here are the things you need to do to go get that grace. It's not, it's not a gift given to you. You've got to do the work. You've got to bear the crosses of life, all right? So that is incorrect teaching, all right? That is heretical. That is evil teaching. Don't buy it, all right? This is not God saying, all right, I'll love you, but I want to see first, and I'll save you, but I want to see first if you do this and that. Carry your cross. No, this is not what Jesus is saying. We, we receive God's grace through, through faith in the blood of Christ and Christ alone, okay? This is also, though, not a form of self-punishment because of maybe how bad we are. I did something bad. Okay, I got to carry a cross, all right, again, we, we, again, we look to the finished work of Christ on the cross. See, see, because of Jesus, there is therefore now, as we said in Romans 8, there is no condemnation. The wrath of God was satisfied. It was appeased because of Christ on the cross. We stand fully forgiven and fully loved and fully saved in Jesus and Jesus alone. So that's not what he's saying. So what is he saying? Because he's saying something. So what is he saying? So let me give us a few thoughts from Scripture. All right, number one, carrying our cross is a way in which we identify with Christ. Let me give us a passage. Romans 6, verses 1 through 5. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Hear the, the union that we have with our, with our Savior here. But, but hear this last verse. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, we, we follow a crucified Savior. Therefore, as his followers, Christ calls on us to identify with him. So what does it mean to pick up your cross? Well, let's ask this question. What was the cross? I wrote this down this week. It was an unbearably cruel instrument of death. The cross brought shame. The cross brought ridicule. The cross brought suffering. And the cross brought death. This is what Jesus is calling us to when he says, carry your cross. You see, if you're, if you're to follow after him, then we need to ask ourselves, are you willing to suffer with him? Are you willing to be ridiculed for the cause of Christ? Are you willing to let go everything that the world says that you need in order to be happy so that you may gain Christ? Or this, are you willing to die for him? Like th this is what Jesus is getting at when he's saying, right, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And if you're thinking, man, that just sounds, that just sounds extreme, <laughs> Like I said, like, again, the things that Jesus said are not easy to take. They aren't. Again, like we said at the beginning, if you think Jesus just taught um, good moral lessons, then you're not reading what Jesus actually said. I mean, this is the language that he commonly uses and what he's calling his followers to. Take up your cross daily. Die to yourself. Follow me. And you're sitting here thinking, man, it just sounds so, I mean, just out there, extreme. Then again, you, you've bought into maybe this westernized um, view of what Christianity is, where no, it's supposed to be comfortable and it's supposed to be safe. And it's supposed to be easy. No, it's not. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever say following Christ is easy, safe, and comfortable. In fact, it says the exact opposite. So we've bought into that. If you hear these words, you're like, man, that's 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 radical. But also, we want to think this as well. This is exactly what Jesus did for you and I. This is exactly what Jesus did for you and I. Let me prove it. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, 
The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is exactly what Jesus did for you and I. He suffered. He was ridiculed. He let go of every, I, Philippians 2 says he didn't count equality with God. He was with God the Father from eternity past, afforded all the rights and responses and every other uh, privileges of, of the heavenly kingdom. It says he, he gave that up, gave that up, took on the form of a servant. He was ridiculed. He gave up all for his bride and even to the point of death. See, Jesus suffered out of love for you. Jesus was ridiculed out of love for you. Jesus let go of everything afforded to him in heaven to purchase his bride. Jesus' life ended on the cross. See, carrying our cross identifies us with the one we're following. Now, yes, I'm gonna let go of everything. I'm going to follow you. I'm willing to suffer for you because you're the greatest treasure. Identifies us with our Savior. But we also see a second thing carrying our cross does. Carrying our cross humbles us. It humbles us. It's, it's Jesus who is first in our lives, not ourselves, right? He says we must deny ourselves. It was John the Baptist who said regarding Jesus and himself in John chapter 3, verse 30, that he must increase. I must decrease, right? It's him, not me. It's not about me. It's about him. See, carrying our cross humbles us, but we also see a third thing, that carrying our cross is a daily discipline. Daily. There's no break. There's no holiday. You know, Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church in, in chapter 15 of, of his first letter to them, says, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. Every day I die to myself. So every morning we read these passages, read these texts, and we okay, every morning we need to wake up and say to ourselves, I need to die to myself today. I need to put the needs of others ahead of myself. I must treasure Christ more than anything. I need to let go of anything that's going to keep me from him. We, must just say, we need to say, just as Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who's living in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the attitude of the Christ follower. I, it's no longer I who live. My identity is not in me anymore. It's not in anything I've earned or accomplished. That's not where I find my hope. My identity is in him. My hope is in him. My joy is in him. My delight is in him. The, the Christ follower would say that there's nothing else in this world that delights my soul like Jesus does. And, and when we feel that temptation to begin to flirt with the things of this world, all right, we're to, we're to identify those things as what they are, as inferior idols that will not bring you any sustaining joy whatsoever. They're promising things that they cannot deliver. And so we want to seek in those moments, in that temptation, we feel our heart want to drift away from Christ to other things. And I want to put that to death because I'm so identifying with my Savior, daily dying to myself, daily putting the needs of others ahead of myself. I'm living for Christ. It's Christ who lives in me, not me myself. I'm died with my Savior when he died died on that cross. This is a daily discipline of grace, daily. But what I also love that is that Jesus is giving us, as he says these hard things, and he says hard things, but he never says hard things without giving us a reason for them or motivation for them. That's, that's what I love about him. So he gives us next this motivation for this daily dying to self, this, this, this carrying our cross and, and, and identifying with our Savior. Look at verses 24 and, and 25. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? See, so not only does, does following Jesus have this requirement, but, but following Jesus has a motivation. Absolutely it does. So why must we carry our, cry, our, our cross? Well, because life lies on the other side of it. That's what Jesus is saying. Why do, we, why do we die to ourselves? Because life lies on the other end of the cross. See, Jesus is saying that, 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 that the death of self is the door to eternal life, meaningful life, purposeful life, 
a redeemed and reconciled life, life as it was intended to be. See, see with all the riches and with all the, the, the treasures that we can accumulate on this earth, and we can accumulate a lot of it, we can accumulate a lot of it, but we take none of it with us, is what Jesus is saying. You can accumulate and you can fill the barns full, bursting at the seams with, with trinkets and toys and cash, and you take none of it with you. And if, you're, if your whole life has been focused on, on accumulating more of those things, he says you're, you're forfeiting your soul. You're losing your soul. And the, just the other day I was driving around, I heard on the radio of a, a famous uh, celebrity comedian who had just passed away. And, and as the, the, the DJs were talking about him and, and his life, they were just going on and on and on about all the awards that, that this, this person had, had won over his career. And they were just saying, man, he had won this many Emmys for, for this show, and he won this many Emmys for, for that show. And I'm driving around because I had this text really just heavy on me, and I heard that, te- and what they're saying, I, and my first thought is just, who cares? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, who, who cares? And I wasn't trying to be cruel or, or disrespectful, but I was just driving. I was just thinking, like, man, who cares about any of that? You know who doesn't? That guy who just passed away. Like, he, he could care, like, it doesn't even matter anymore. He can't look at them anymore. He can't hold on to them anymore. He can't polish them anymore. He can't remember his days on the show for which he won whatever award. And, like, he has no, they have no significance whatsoever. They're going to be shipped away. They're going to be stuck on a shelf, maybe put in a box. And then years down the road, someone might stumble across this, this old Emmy award and be like, oh, oh, yeah, I remember him. And then it goes right back in the box, right? Like, who cares? And yet, man, we, we, we put all of, our, all of our effort in those things. I mean, what, what, are, what are the Emmy Awards in your life, right? Like, I don't think anybody in here is going to be winning an Emmy. Anytime, but what are, what are the Emmys in your life that, man, we just chase after, chase after, and chase after? I remember listening to a, a sermon years ago um, by, by Francis Chan, and he, he was speaking to his church, and he brought on stage like this long rope, I know some of, some of you here have, have seen that, and, and he brought this long rope, and it was stretching. He had, the, had the, the, the beginning of it, and it just stretched all the way across stage and backstage, so you can even see the end. He, he said, imagine this rope um, is picturing eternity, right? Just, just life forever. And at the very front of the rope, the edge that he was holding, he had like just maybe like that a little much, just colored in red. And he's like, imagine this is, this is your life right here in the, in the grand scope of, of eternity, He's like, this is your life. You're here for a moment. Like, right, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a vapor. You're here and then you're gone. And he says, so many of us in this room are putting everything we have into that little, that little red line on this, on this rope. And like, what is Jesus calling us to? He's calling us to forsake all of that. They mean nothing. Don't, don't seek to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. Live for that which is eternal. It's such a clear way to picture, but so often, all of us in here, that's exactly where we are. That's exactly where I am so often. Like, I want everything just to be, I want this one little sliver of my life, this little vapor of my life to be just right. I'm going to put everything in this, and then we're gone, and it means nothing anymore. And that's what Jesus is saying. You can gain everything, but you're going to forfeit your own soul. What does it matter? It doesn't matter at all. You've wasted your life. But see, on the other side of the coin, if you lose, if you lose yourself, I mean, if you identify with Jesus and his death and you're following after him, say, I'm denying myself, he's saying you find life. You find life. In May of 2000, John Piper preached a sermon to a bunch of college students that honestly impacted a generation. And I say that because I was actually one of those college students. I remember hearing this sermon preached and it just transformed just my, my thinking of who Christ is and what we're called to live for. And I want to quote a little bit from this sermon. In this sermon, he said this in front of a, a thousands of college students. He said, three weeks ago, we got word at our church that, that Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards had both been killed in Cameroon. He says, Ruby was over 80, single all her life, she poured it out for one great thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor, the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor pushing 80 years old and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. He said, the brakes give way, over the cliff they go, and they're gone, killed instantly. 
He says, and I ask my people, was that a tragedy? Two lives driven by one great vision, spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ. Two decades after almost all of their American counterparts have retired to throw their lives away on trivial things. He says, no, that is not a tragedy. He says, that is glory. He says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. And he's, he picks up a, a Reader's Digest and he reads from Reader's Digest. He says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. He reads the story. Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. They now live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, playing softball and collecting shells. He said, that's a tragedy. And he says, and people today are spending billions of dollars to try and persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. And he says, I get 40 minutes with you to plead with you to don't buy it. He says, with all my heart, I plead with you, don't buy that dream, the American dream, a nice house, a nice car, a nice job, a nice family, a nice retirement, collecting shells as the last chapter before you stand before the king to give an account of what you did. And he says, here it is, Lord, my shell collection. And I've got a nice swing. And look at my boat. And he says before these college students, he says, don't waste your life. Don't waste it. Now hear me, the point he is making is not that retirement is bad or sinful. It is not, all right? The point he is not making is that if you live in Punta Gorda, Florida, in your retirement, that that is bad or sinful. It is not. What he is saying and what Jesus is saying from our text today is don't live for yourself. Don't spend your life, whatever age you are, wherever you are in your phase of life, don't spend your life, no matter what you're doing, collecting trinkets and toys because you think in some strange way that it will make you happy, complete, and satisfied. Don't buy into that. That is a path that leads to death. The world is a soulless and soul-destroying system. Don't buy into that dream. Christ's followers do not buy into that dream. See, following Jesus means that we are to pick up our cross. It means that we are to die to ourself. There's a motivation, there's a reasoning for it, but in the end, I love this final point. Following Jesus brings a future glory. Verse 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You see, for all of those who follow Jesus, all of the suffering, all of the difficulty, all of, all of the denial of self, all of the carrying of our cross and identifying with a, a, a suffering Savior, right, culminates, though, in a future glory when Jesus returns as the conquering king. It, it culminates in that. That, that's, that's where our mind is. I, I, I mentioned Chan's sermon illustration, right? Like that he's saying that's what we're living for, not, not putting all of our attention, affection on, on that little sliver. It's like we're looking at the eternity. Like that Paul is constantly telling us in, in, the, in, in the New Testament here to, to look to that which is to come, to keep your eyes fixed on, on Christ and Christ alone. See, that's what awaits us. That's what makes all of this self-denial and abandonment of self worth it because there's a future glory coming for us. And in fact, Tabidi Anabwile says it this way, that in the Christian life, first comes the cross, then comes the crown. The reward is a crown, a kingdom. This kingdom is a share in God's glory. See, for those who follow Jesus, we have, we have set before us an unending glory, a share in God's glory forever. This is why it makes sense to, to die to ourselves and to forsake this world. It offers us nothing. We're gaining something better. It's why we talk about joy here all the time, like all the time we're talking about it here. Like we're, not, we're not just seeking pain and misery because we, we think we just need to be in pain and miserable. No, we're not seeking that. 
but we're enduring for a season in this life the sufferings of this world because we know there's a future glory coming. There's a greater treasure to be had in Christ and not in this world. So I will endure for the cause of Christ. I will identify with my Savior. I will let go of all these things because there's something far better laid up for me for all of eternity. See, that's where our hope lies as Christians. Not in ourselves, but in the appearing of our Savior who is one day returning and bringing all the darkness and all the sin and all the death to an end. That's where our hope lies. And so Christ has called us to follow him in this way. It is not just a prayer that you pray. It isn't. It's dying. It's radical abandonment to self. It's carrying your cross and saying, it's Jesus that I'm trusting in. It's Jesus I'm resting in every single second of the day. And we have the church to encourage us in this because you cannot do this alone. So we, we walk by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit alive and doing the work in us, but we walk together, linking arms one by one with one another, saying, let's go, let's encourage one another in these things because on your own, you're gonna be picked off, right? But in community, there's safety and security. So let's go together, let's pursue together, let's make Christ known. Let's pray. So God, we come before you this morning knowing that, that the words spoken by Jesus so often are difficult to hear, but at the very same time, we know the promise behind those difficult words is life and meaning and purpose and joy and salvation. And so God, we, we are to be a people not just by, not, not just by checking a box that says, yes, we identify as Christians, that is not what identifies us, what we, what we check a box as, but we identify as Christians when we identify with our Savior, when we follow after him, when we are daily just trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross, when we are letting go of the things of this world to say yes to that which is greatest. And so for so many, for maybe too many of us, even here this morning, we, we get so easily sucked into the, the trivialities and the meaninglessness of this life as we think maybe that's what it's all about. If I can just be comfortable for the 80 years or so that God gives me, then that's what it's all about. And Jesus so clearly says that that is a waste. You forfeited your soul. And so God, I pray that we would be a people um, passionately in pursuit of you every single moment of our lives and when we fail and we will so again we never want to say these things and just say okay just do better but we we want to turn back to christ knowing that when we stumble when we fall when we do feel that that temptation to, to to draw away from you and when we do fall into that trap we know that christ has has accomplished this perfect work for us and that the cross makes us whole and complete and so we confess our sins we repent of those sins and we continue on in pursuing that which is greatest and so God, I pray we would never come away from here thinking that, that we just need to be more moral in our, in our life, but that we would turn to Christ, rest in the gospel, and that the gospel would so permeate our minds and our hearts and that we, that, so that we would then seek to do that which is right, so that we would seek to then follow Christ. I just love for him. So God, these are weighty things. I feel burdened by them even just now, and so I want to just turn them to you and just say, God, would you do the work? And so we thank you, God, that you have been growing us. We thank you that we are being sanctified. We thank you for these brothers and sisters here who have just um, said no to the, the things of this world to pursue that which is greater. Help us to grow even more. Help us pursue that together of love for you and love for one another. We put all of this before you and pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Let's sing.
if you would, for just a second, have a, have a seat. We'll, uh, we'll get you out here soon. Um, but a few, few quick things here as we, as we close. First of all, if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you for visiting with us. I'd love to meet with you as we close here in just a few moments here, um, right at this table here, just to, just to say hi and thank you for coming, just to give you a gift. Um, if we can serve you by praying for you, what men and women down front that want to serve you as well and just pray with you through whatever the Lord's doing in, in your life. And so please don't slip out of here before um, taking advantage of those things in which we want to serve you as. Um, so a few weeks ago, Seth Voltner, he was our, he was our student director for the last four years. Um, he accepted a position up in Wisconsin. And so he actually, he and his wife, they moved there about two weeks ago. But they came down this week because we want to just have a send-off for them. And also just take a moment just to pray for them and their new, uh, new ministry. So I invite Seth to come up to the stage and Heather and Lydia, who's out. So I want to invite them to come to the stage. And I know Seth wanted to just say a few words to the church. And then uh, deacons, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you guys to come up on stage. We're going to surround the Voltner family and just pray for them. So here you go, Seth. Hey, guys. Well, it's good to be back. Um, you know, uh, four years ago, Heather and I had, were just freshly married and uh, drove in in the Honda Civic and and uh, pulled into the red brick house and uh, it, it started this adventure it was great to be able to be to to start our marriage in a new place with new people and a new work um, that was just uh, a really special time for us as a couple uh, to grow in our relationship and to do it here uh, it was it was great to also at that time be uh, starting new relationships with all of you and and uh, to, to grow in that way and to grow together in Christ. So we, we, will, we were grateful for that. That was four years ago. Two years ago, uh, you remember that Lydia was born and all the complications and struggles that we went through uh, at that time. And it was overwhelming to us uh, to see the support of our church family and how you were just unbelievably generous uh, and, uh, and just so kind and caring and supportive through that time. It, it was just fantastic. And then like Matt said, two weeks ago, we packed up our van uh, full of stuff that could fit in a barn. <laughs> and uh, so we had several thoughts about driving that particular van off a cliff, actually. Um, <laughs> just starting over. But, uh, and I mean getting out while, you know, open the door and jump out <laughs> while it is still going off the cliff, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I just want to say we will miss you guys like crazy. Um, you know, we're going to miss our community group. That has been a really, really special group of people to us. Uh, been great getting into the word every week with them and to, um, man, just grow together in our lives uh, like that and to share each other's kids and things like that. Just, it's just a blast. And if you are not in a community group, man, you have to. You really should. Uh, invest your life into a small group of people like that. Um, we'll, miss, we'll miss the work. We'll miss uh, diving into God's word and trying to translate it well. It's been awesome to get to know. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but for people who are from Wisconsin, like you can just be three hours south and it's a completely different culture. It really is. And so it was great to learn what people care about here and to learn how people uh, operate and, and to try to work together as, as a people. Um, to do that, but also the people that we worked with. The staff here is amazing. Uh, we are so blessed here at Calvary with the people that lead us and, and Matt and Trevor's leadership. And as this team has been forged over time and continues to develop, uh, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And so Calvary is so blessed with the staff team uh, that is here. Uh, I wanted to also, you know, we, we will miss especially the students and their parents. That the, the relationships that God has given us through these students, if you do not know them, you really need to get to know them. Um, they are hilarious, uh, they are fun, and uh, they are growing in grace and learning in, in how to care and listen and think through these things and that their faith would become uh, uh, real and uh, as they are shifting and growing. It's just such a special time of life that people either loved or hated and and uh, if you were there, you, you either loved or hated it. And so I just, I really hope that you would, how great it would be if we continue to invest 
in our students that you would, uh, from the oldest to the youngest, that we would, we would all uh, support each other that way and continue to do so. Um, but then, honestly, the thing that we will miss the most is just this right here. Uh, there was nothing like a Sunday at Calvary. And uh, I, loved, I loved singing with you. I loved uh, hearing God's word proclaimed so faithfully. And, um, and to be able to get to know so many wonderful people that, that uh, God is changing continually, that we together are learning to find our joy in Jesus. That has just been wonderful for me. So for me and Heather to be able to grow together, to grow in the work that God has given us to do, we're excited to carry that forward as uh, we go up to Viroqua, Wisconsin. Um, it's a wonderful place. If you like fly fishing or snowshoeing, we've got a bed. Get ready, 513 East Linton Avenue, Viroqua, Wisconsin, 54665. Okay, you got a room to stay in. Uh, you guys are like family, and so um, we, we can't wait to come down and visit again once the baby number two comes, and so uh, we'll be seeing you soon. But I just wanted to say just how, how grateful we are to what a wonderful people uh, and what a wonderful thing and work that God is doing here at Calvary. So thank you, everyone. So I'll invite the deacons coming up on stage here. Trevor, come up on stage as well. We just want to kind of surround the Voltner family here and just pray for them. So as they're making their way up here, um, we use a term around here sometimes called gospel goodbyes. And so this is a, a gospel goodbye. And, and the meaning behind that is Jesus is building his church. And that means he's going to take people and put them where they can best be used to further the kingdom of God. And so we want to make sure we very well understand that that Calvary, 1017 North Street, is not the only place that the gospel is being proclaimed and being built. Uh, but we want to be um, mission-minded in that. And so that means when the Lord calls, as much as we would want to hold on, we need to let go. And so um, we're thrilled for the Voltner family. We're sad to see them go. Uh, good friends, um, good family, and just they love, they love Jesus and they love the students here. And so I know the church up in uh, Wisconsin is going to be very... Uh, blessed by having them up there. And so um, I've actually already talked with the pastor up there just to chew them out. Um, no, it was good. No, just to just say, man, we want to send them and, and we're thrilled for them. But we just wanted to pray for them. And so we're surrounding them here. I know it's kind of tight quarters here. Maybe you guys can move up and, and deacons can kind of surround around them. But we just want to lay hands on them, pray for them. Church, pray with us. I invite, um, I invite Jake if you would pray first and then uh, Trevor close. Lord, we just thank you so much for Seth and Heather and for the time that you've given us here with them. Thank you, Lord, for their passion for you to see your work completed here uh, in the lives of the students and the families here at the church. God, thank you for the impact they've had on the lives of the people that they've interacted with. Um, God, it's just been such uh, a refreshing thing uh, to see a family who is so about you and about your work, willing to do, as Matt just spoke about this morning, just to pour out their lives uh, God is an offering uh, to see um, much made of you, uh, of your word. Thank you, God, for their faithfulness. We can pray that you would continue to bless them and uh, to bless their work as they uh, leave from here, Lord, and, and move up back to Wisconsin. God, I pray that you would just uh, have your hand on everything that they're involved in, God, that you would just bless them in an amazing way, that when they come back to visit, Lord, we'd be able to celebrate with them all the amazing things that you're doing uh, through their ministry and through their work. God, we praise you uh, that we can send them off as, as a brother and a sister, Lord, uh, knowing they will continue to be faithful to you. Um, God, just bless them. You know me, pray. God, we praise you so much for this opportunity that you've given us to do what Matt, I think, accurately called a gospel goodbye. We praise you that the kingdom is not being divided, it's being multiplied as you send out one of our own even though it, it creates in us some sorrow. God, there's rejoicing at seeing you at work. God, you've worked so clearly in Seth and Heather's lives, and I just pray for them. God, bless them during this stage of life as they welcome a new child in the upcoming weeks. God, I just pray that you would um, increase the way that the, the, both of them and their whole family ministers for the cause of Christ and for the, the kingdom's sake. So I praise you for Seth and all the ways that I've been changed because of the influence of this godly man. I thank you for a man whose commitment to relationships has rubbed off on everyone around him. God, how can you help us smile when you see Seth and Heather? 
We just love them, and we're so grateful that you allowed our lives to intersect with theirs for these brief few years. Would you now, God, as they travel over today and over the next several days, as their minds are racing, I'm sure, would you calm them? Would you show them your love? Would you undergird them with the strength and the courage that comes with being in the center of the will of God? And would you allow others to experience there in Wisconsin what we've experienced here, a man and a woman who are sold out for Jesus? So thank you for them, God. Thank you for the, the day today where we celebrate your goodness. And even though we say goodbye, Father, at the same time, we say thank you. And we praise you for all of these things and look forward to what you'll continue to do, both in Wisconsin through their ministry and, and here as their legacy lives on, God, the way that they've invested in lives. So we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to let Seth and Heather, they're going to slip out, and everybody can kind of make their way off stage. We're going to close here. Uh, Seth and Heather are going to make their way to the welcome center. So we're going to have a little just kind of going away reception for them. Um, and so we're going to give them just a few moments here to slip out. So I'm kind of drawing it out a little bit well, so we can make sure they get there first. Um, and so make sure you say your goodbyes to them. Stop in there before you head out. Before we pick up your, before, be sure to pick up your children first and then bring them in there. And then uh, we'll say our goodbyes to them there. Well, let's stand. I'm going to close with Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It says this, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you in the Welcome Center.